Yeah. There's no specifics really coming up, or not a lot, but I have a very powerful emotional experience, and, and the experience is that uh, it's sort of like the memory of who I am is sort of beginning to dawn in my mind, and at the same time, a very intense fear is like welling up. I started to look at that closer yesterday, and um, was looking like what, what's behind the fear. And there is like sort of the assumption that I have managed to shrink myself down to this little body and this little persona. And I, I pull that off and that it's going to be like I'm not going to be able to go back to, to who I really am. Yeah, I'm going to like uh, break during the journey. I'm going to go insane. I'm going to like totally, it's going to just go the wrong way. And the words that came to me that I think is from the Course is like, something like the, the son has simply disappeared into the father as the father has in the son. The world has never been at all. <coughs> Heaven remains a constant state or something like that. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, I'm going, I'm feeling very uncomfortable like this just crawling in my body. And I'm like hearing the argument that, okay, maybe this is an illusory existence that you're having. But at least you're, you're existing, like at least it's an existence, even if it's not real. But what is it that will be there, like when I let this go? And I just like, I have fear, I have like, I'm longing for it, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have a desire. But the fear is very intense, that's where I'm at. Yeah, it's beautiful. But you can just open it up, because I think that's why we're given a function, you know, call it whatever you want, a, a miracle worker or whatever, that it's like a, it's literally a life's devotion to be shown and taken into what seems to be the unknown and away from what seems to be the familiar. And, yeah, I, I can relate. That's, those are the same feelings I had initially when I started to really have heart opening experiences to start to work with the course, you know, even in between going to course groups and whatever, there would be this pounding heart and kind of like, uh-oh, you know, where is this going to lead? And I could just feel like my whole trajectory, my whole life, and I was looking at my expectations and assumptions, my parents and family and all those things that seemed to be going in one direction. And then this was going in a completely different direction and and there will be fear that will come up as you open up to your function and uh, we're just here to join together and rejoice with you in finding your function. I mean obviously to come all the distance that you've come to just take that step is a great indicator of your willingness and your determination and it's not that we can actually kind of give you a, a road map and, and that's what I always wanted, you know, give me like a five-year plan or a ten-year plan. And I would never get that, even though I had a degree in urban planning, a five-year degree in urban planning. I never, I never got a plan from Jesus or the Holy Spirit. It, it's really, in, in my experience, it's about giving up the need to have any plan. It's that, you know, take no care for your life and to really not even care what's going to happen Yes, and the practicality of it is amazing. Like, it seems like all the skills that I had developed in an ego framework, I've just marveled and watched how the Holy Spirit has used them, you know, in, in just miraculous ways. So it wasn't like an unwinding, almost like if you, had a, you were just a screw that had been screwed into that wood wall there. And you, you can't, I always use the analogy, you can't take a hammer and try to yank a screw out of a wood wall. You, you have to take a screwdriver or a power drill or, you know, some of us want the power drill right away. <laughs> we only have a screwdriver, so we have to start <laughs> with the screwdriver and turn, 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 because it's so wound in, you know, that's the way the ego is. It's really wound us into this, this belief system, and that's why it takes a lot of turns to come out of it. But really, you know, the way that the Spirit seems to work is using whatever we've learned in school, all our life experiences, even the parables, a lot of the parables that 
Jennifer and I share are actually, you know, you talk about your, your family life or your brother, and those are the kind of things. I used to wonder when I got on this journey, oh, do I have to come up with parables? I'm never going to be able to come up with parables. I mean, I'm not a good parable writer. And the spirit was like laughing, saying, oh, the stuff you're going to go through, it's going to be rich with parable. You're not going to have any trouble with the parable part because we, we have our, what we believe in gets used and our skills even get used. So it's just the same things that we might have used to have a great career or be very famous or be in the who's who book or something like that. We don't really care about any of those things and therefore it gets used in miraculous, wondrous ways, but those skills do get reused, that's for sure. Well, if you're willing, if you're willing to just co totally go for it, it came into my mind, now you're going to learn radical trust, right now. And so when it would come into my mind, how are you going to pay your bills? I said, radical trust, that's how I'm going to pay my bills. Then you can get that screw just, like you, it'll just unscrew itself practically. Yeah, it's true. And, and I, I mean, with a lot of people here in the room, I could just go through, you know, with, I don't know, with Carrie, what is it, when did I meet you? About 10, about a decade ago, there have been so many steps and so many joinings. I mean, Jesus was quite famous in the Bible, you know. There's this long-haired guy and he's going around and you're reading about it and he's just like looking into people's eyes. Peter, so on and so forth, say, follow me. How's that? You know, you've got a life. You think you've got a life. At least, you know, whatever it is, fishing, whatever. Peter was married and, and had children. You know, imagine that. Married and children, like the, the married with children, like the, the sitcom. And then this guy with long hair comes along and just says, follow me. And you feel there's something going on in your heart, like swirling, like, oh my, I'm going to, oh my God, I'm going <laughs> to. And I don't know where this is going to take me or what's going to happen. But I've had many, many of those kind of moments where, you know, we join together and, and there's a feeling in our hearts that we have like a lifelong assignment together. You know, people are talking about soulmates. Forget soulmates. I've had that <laughs> feeling with so many people now. I haven't even counting. But it's been this deep thing like, like somehow we've been brought together for a very holy purpose. Mm -hmm. And we're going we're gonna to reach it. We're going to go all the way to it. Or we were talking about this thing about the, the illusion of future enlightenment. You know, I have never come together with anybody with this thing about lifetimes or future lifetimes or this and this, you know, there's always an, a presence of, it's kind of, maybe not an urgency, but there's some kind of deep presence like, don't miss this, you know, this, don't miss this opportunity. Like, you know, this is not something you want to pass by. There's something really important here. And then the deeper I got into it, I remember 20, 20 some years ago, 21 years ago, when I took off on those five years of just traveling around with no money and no tent and no, nothing really, it was, it was Jesus telling me, everyone you meet has a gift for you. And, and are you willing to accept it? Are you willing to find it? But look for it. My first trip was, I went to Roscoe, New York, and the Foundation for A Course in Miracles, Ken and Gloria Wapnick. I went to see Tara Singh. Uh, up in Monroe, Michigan, and then I went on these trips in 91 and 92 that I was gone for five and a half weeks and then six weeks and I met all these people that had devoted their whole life to the Course and, and I could feel and hear Jesus saying, everyone you meet has a gift. You know, I was to really go and meet them and stay with them, whether it was for hours or days or even weeks, until I really could experience the gift. Then I was kind of free to move on. It was a fun assignment to just be traveling around and, and looking for the gifts. It was like an Easter egg hunt, except, you know, it's everyone you meet, there's something to behold there. You know, I could go in depth with a number of the people in the room here because we both said yes, and out of saying yes, there's been this kind of collaboration that's unfolded that feels very, very strong very, very strong. Like with Jenny I, over there in Sweden, I was doing a retreat 
down at some cast thing and she just kind of wandered in. She just followed a strong, strong prompt to come to this castle. She comes in without registering <laughs> and then she leaves before the conference is over. And then she, she looked at me and I said, I said, uh, come over and, and find me in, in the United States. And you did. And how old was your son at that point? He was eight or nine years old. But she felt the calling. And thus it started. So these are very deep callings. And when you start to feel the calling, there is kind of a sense of wanting to really expose things in your life, things that you've kept hidden and patterns that you've been on for some time, there's this feeling that you can actually now get underneath mm -hmm. that pattern, that it's not, it doesn't have you anymore, that you're going to actually unearth it mm -hmm. and, and free your mind from it. You can feel it. There's like an energy around that. And there were a lot of questions. I know when Jenny came over, there were a lot of questions. And I know when Carrie, when you first, first came down to the Peace House, and it took you hours longer than you thought, just coming down to visit me. And, and I have heard so many stories like that over the years that are so indicative of this resistance mm. to taking the straight and narrow way. The ego doesn't mind if you take your time about awakening, but when you really have a calling and you're really going to go for it, then there can be resistance. And I've got a number, I think I've got three different stories of, of, of rear view mirrors getting ripped off. And, and that's a pretty strong symbol when you think about it. Because the rear view mirror is only for looking back. And your rear view mirror got ripped off of your car when you were coming down that time. To me, that was such an obvious sign that you were really willing to, to dive in and not keep such a focus on the past and looking back. And it was glorious. I remember that. Just a great opportunity. I think I asked you questions all the questions, 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 just to have that opportunity to just ask them all. And a lot of hanging in over those, that decade. There's been many times where you've wanted to just say, ah, just throw in the towel and, you know, it's, it's been quite a, a journey. Any one of the stories would be quite an interesting miniseries because the calling was heard and the calling was felt. And there was action taken on it, you know, and it is really, it's all in the mind, but it's, it's like an unwinding in the mind of this deeply embedded ego belief system. And when people say sometimes, well, you just have to change your mind about the world. You don't have to change anything in form. And I have heard that excuse quite a lot as I've gone around, because I travel a lot. So people would say one time I visit them and, well, the Course tells me all I have to change my mind, and I don't have to change anything in form, and I only have to change my mind. So I'm going to work on changing my mind. Then I travel around, come back months or a year later. I say, how's your life? It's terrible. I've got a terrible job, terrible relationship. They tell me all the terribles, the terrible, 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 terrible. But the Course tells me all I have to do is change my mind. <laughs> I don't have to change the form. I go around, come back the next year. How are you doing? Terrible. The relationship's terrible. I'm in another terrible relationship, and I'm still in a terrible job. I'm still there. Da, 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 da. I'm stuck in this city. And da, 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 da. But the Course tells me all I have to do is change my mind. You know, we have to be practical. And I know that in my life, you know, when I really got the call, the Course does say in the teacher's manual, you know, that really the first change in your mind is really a change of attitude. Uh, you know, our changes in the circumstances necessary in God's teacher's lives, the first change is a change in attitude. That attitude of radical trust, just that shift to radical trust, you know, can make all the difference right there. And there will seem to be changes from that residual income and all those things. There's been all kinds of seeming form changes with that radical trust. Yeah. You're like flying by the seat of your pants, yeah. you know, and, and, but after a while you go, okay, I'm, I will fly by the seat of my pants if that's what it takes, but they come. Yeah, I feel like in even going and having all of my questions answered and having the opportunity to um, you know, do some traveling with you, and you know, that's when I started doing websites and things, 
but I had no idea of the implications <laughs> of it when I first showed up. You know, it's just like, it just, it starts to dawn on you, you know, even after kind of like, like you start peeling the layers of the onion, you really have no idea of the implications, what it actually means. And yeah, there was times when I had to leave because it was just like, I didn't understand when I first showed up. It was like, I just didn't have any way of knowing that. And it was like, there was a sense of frustration around it, not being able to relate or, yeah, just going through pockets of like intense darkness and depression and, and not that it has to go that way, but you know, for me it did. And just times of needing to leave and evaluate, what am I doing and what do I want? And then the call, just it, it's just still there in your mind, and it's, it just doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. So and then coming back and just being, you know, at a different level of readiness and willingness, and just you know going through more depths in my mind. And like this past ten years has just been a pretty amazing journey. And you know, I think even more recently, just kind of noticing like this like real strength in just my willingness and like just sort of a sense of stability that is there now. It's just kind of seemed to take, you know, some work to cultivate in a way, but that it is there. It's like the fruits of that are tangible now and, you know, it feels like that I do have something to extend, which is you know, just great. And yeah, but yeah, it's been, yeah, there have been a lot of little steps involved and there's been, times when I needed to go away and come back and, you know, it, I've played it out, <laughs> so. Even Claire in, in Brother Sun Sister Moon, she, she, didn't, she didn't go and come back so much before the, the scene where she's just, they're running across <laughs> the fields to each other. You know, I knew you'd come. I had to come. I want to find joy, you know, and all this and this. But all those scenes before that, she's like in her parents' house and watching down, watching St. Francis, watching the, the brothers, you know, walking through the streets and preaching and doing the things. And even that time in the rain, you know, she comes out and gives him the loaf of bread, you know. It was a lot of steps running up to that. And then to join a group of men with their hair cut, you know, you know, and then cu cutting her, you know, that was, was a great movie of that kind of deep devotion to answer that call in a big way, you know, it, it just, but she had steps running up to that. She just, she, she didn't come until she really, it really, it moved her, you know, she just watched a bit, watched from afar. to there being community here now. And those steps can be very gentle and gradual, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and that's it's great because it's sort of like whatever anyone is ready for, it's, it's available. And, and then people who have seemingly gone ahead, you know, lots of people to talk to. Yeah, yeah, there's pillars and pillars of trust, like reflections of that, you know, because so many steps have been taken. And, and we all know that it, since it's all one mind, we're it's the synergy of, of we're taking this for everyone, you know, it's not like you're, after a while, it's the, even though they seem huge, when, when you take them and you move through them and you're lifted up into these higher and higher states of mind, you do start to feel like I'm doing this for the whole universe. And it does start to wash away this little voice in the mind that's like saying, yours, look what you're sacrificing. Look at the people that are getting squashed and left behind and, you know, for, for, it's selfish, 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 that voice that tells us it's the spiritual journey. Here we're going through the forgiveness process for the whole universe of, of waking up the sleeping Son of God and this voice is going to hammer away like that bird of just, it's selfish, it's selfish, it's selfish, when really we're, you've got a lot of witnesses of, of how life-changing it has been. And when you start to look at what actually, when people ask me, what did you actually give up? What, what did it cost you? You know, even I think of Mary Baker Eddy, you know, thinking about that book she wrote, Science and Health, and near the end of her life just talking, thinking about what did it cost me? But actually, I've just had this experience that 
that there's been no cost. I really don't feel like I've given up anything. I mean, it was a washing of that belief in sacrifice. It was a turning of thinking that there were things of the world that were valuable and opening more to that, like the, the mandala experience, you know, with the, the rake, you know, the, the intricate sand paintings. There was a time when I really was looking at like the sand paintings and really marveling at the colors and the textures and all of the intricacies. And then the more I just gave myself over to the miracles and deeper trust, there comes a point when the rake coming across, you have a big laugh, you have a Buddha belly laugh when the rake comes across. Like sandcastles, you know, we've made sometimes intricate sandcastles and then when the tide comes in, whoosh, to really enjoy that instead of like feeling like, oh no. Lost I've lost something, yeah. you know, and, and nothing more convincing than having that happen with relationships. Mm. You know, when, when someone seems to say goodbye and you can, you know, it's more like Pocahontas, you know, when John Smith has to leave at the end scene of Pocahontas and he's, he's injured and he's in the ship and she goes running, running, running up to the the cliff and all the leaves are swirling behind her and they all whoosh out across the ocean, go all the way out across the ocean and swirl around John Smith, you know, as he's leaving. And it's so beautiful because she's not leaving. She's, <laughs> she's not going. She's not going. She, it's the end of their relationship, so to speak, and, and yet there's this, all the leaves are going out over the ocean, just swirling around him. You know, in love, and like love is so all-embracing and all-encompassing. And then it's even better when the sequel comes and she feels that she has to go over there and she goes over there and she falls in love with another guy, not John Smith. And she also discovers all, the, she tries to dress like the British and put on all the faces. She tries to, for the sake of John Smith, she tries to become British not working. That is not going to happen. Pocahontas is not British. <laughs> She's not going to ever fit into that form. And, and that's the realization she comes to. And so she says goodbye to England and John Smith's not going back with her, but, her, but this reflection of her mind who just accepts her just the way she is does come back on the boat with her to her homeland. Beautiful metaphor that we, you know, it's really just, it's following our heart and not compromising in following our heart and coming to a sense of self-acceptance that we don't have to put on a mask or, you know, change form to, to kind of be like a chameleon to fit in and deserve that love. I'll just change my color or change my stripes and that's not what we're asked to do. Yeah, it's un uncompromising in, in its way and I think that, I'm, I'm trying to think of anyone I know who's really authentically doing this work who hasn't gone through an intense period of disorientation. I mean, serious, you know, feeling incredibly disoriented and like the rug is being pulled out from under them. And we talked about it, the dis illusionment mm -hmm. is what yeah. you called it. I, I call it being in the spin cycle, you know, where it's like everything that you have an attachment to, all your pockets are being emptied. And that's what you want. Yeah. That's the deepest desire of your heart is don't let me hold on to anything that could keep me from the truth. Yeah. But it's, it's intense. Yep. It, it just is softened by mighty companions, it's softened by those around that, that are like in Pocahontas, like Grandmother Willow. You know, she's, she's got a sense of humor, she sometimes snaps her branches uh, or even trips somebody or this and that in a humorous way, but she's, she, you know, and, and finally, you know, that's her song, Listen to Your Heart, You Will Understand. You know, that's, that's her one song <laughs> in Pocahontas. And, but I feel like that's, that's why it's, a, it's like a time collapse. I mean, what seemed to be things that I went through for years and years and years, I just now have a strong feeling that it's just not that way. In the power of our joining, we are collapsing time. It is shortened. 
you still go through those disorientations and disillusionment, but there is some kind of a, almost like a spiritual cocoon mm -hmm. that's there now. And, and just when you feel like, you know, you just can't grasp it at all and understand, then all of a sudden witnesses start to show up and say, well, here's what I went through. And they just, the spirit just starts talking through them. And it happens over and over and over again. I remember KJ had that moment when you were over in Europe and it was looking really dark. Like, we were really wondering if you could do this. And then Jenny had such a strong prompt to call you and had a Skype conversation and, and I could just feel the energy of that. You know, the spirit was like, you were down like way down in the pit and or just hanging on by a thread on the edge of the cliff and just wondering if you were going to make it or drop and everything and then the spirit just, Jenny came through and very clear and direct and just just what you needed to hear at that point. And yeah, look at you know, how things change and how, how all the steps that you've taken after that, just an enormous number. And I just, I just am so grateful for that, that context that we have. We're really being used, all of us are being used in a very deep way and it's, it's just amazing the speed up. Mm -hmm. And here that you shared it this afternoon, well, it's just the gift keeps on giving and giving and extending. I just keep having this thought, like how oh, you said, KJ went through some stuff, I'm like, did I? He's like, yes. <laughs> and then he started talking and talking and talking and sharing and sharing, and it was very inspiring. It's just like, you have to, you just, I think it's important to remind yourself that there's been miracles and that you can trust, and, 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 and sharing those parables with other people, it's just, it's very strengthening. So. Yeah. It's involuntary. It was funny, the other night when Suzanne was sitting here and was just sharing, and after that she said, my mind was a total blank. And then all of a sudden it started to come out, and, and she was like thinking, I don't even remember that <laughs> parable anymore. And it was like, Holy Spirit was like, well, it doesn't need your remembrance. Here it comes. Because you start to, you don't feel identified with it, but when the Spirit wants to use you in some way that blesses the universe or helps, it just, it's involuntary, it just comes through, and it's, at first that's uncomfortable, you know. <laughs> but ultimately the Spirit is coming and using our, whatever's in our pool of our past and our parables and our memories and our bodies and our voices, and we do get more comfortable with it. But at first it's a little creepy, you know, because you think you know who you are, and these things start coming out of your mouth, and you're like, who said that? What was that? But then after a while, it's like, oh, I think this is actually helpful. <laughs> I'm not in control of it, but, you know, it starts to feel more, you feel more comfortable with it. That's like the miracle working has begun. And, and you know, you will get more and more relaxed with it, you know, as it goes on.